Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Getting Ahead of the Next Extreme Weather Event, How Texas Companies Can Earn Revenue by Supporting the Power Grid. My name is Caroline Thompson. I'm a marketing manager at LEAP, and I'll be getting our event started today. So today we'll be diving into how grid services work and their potential to support a more resilient, cleaner power grid in Texas. We'll talk about how grid services opportunities are evolving in Texas, and most importantly, how businesses on the ground in Texas can take advantage of these opportunities to earn extra revenue and support the grid. We'll showcase how businesses are already benefiting from approaches to grid services, um, and of course, how your company can learn more about participating. And we're hoping to have about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the session. So please submit your questions uh, throughout and we'll answer as many as we can. Today we'll be hearing from Jaden Crawford, Director of Market Development here at LEAP, which provides access to grid services opportunities and energy markets. We'll hear from Tracy Alexander, Strategic Market Development Manager at NRG, an energy retailer in Texas and from Andrew Hammond, the Vice President of Utility Solutions at GridPoint, a leader in smart building technology. And with that, let's get started. Uh, Jaden, take it away. Thank you. Um, as we start to talk about weather, we first need to talk a little bit about how the, the resource mix is changing. That means the, the way that that we receive power, or more specifically, from where we receive power is changing. It used to be the case that there were really big generators that burned uh, mostly coal that uh, would transport electricity across lines to uh, everybody that needed electricity, and it was it was a one-way flow. Um, but that's changing. Uh, as we get more and more renewable energy resources, so we're talking about wind, and we're talking about solar, when we're talking about uh, these renewables for the most part. Um, what's happening is that they are cleaner. We're getting the benefits of lower carbon and lower emissions, but they're less predictable than fossil fuel plants. Think of a fossil fuel plant kind of like an airplane, and they are like airplanes in many ways. Um, when you need more power, you can throttle it forward, you can get more power. When you need to back it off, you can back it off um, and keep that balance where you need it to be. Um, with renewables, you don't really have that. They're, they're going to work when the sun is shining, they're going to work when the wind is blowing, and they're gonna produce less when it's not. And so what needs to happen is that something needs to take up that slack. Something needs to adjust to compensate for the fact that that generation is changing based on factors that aren't demand for electricity. Um, and so one other problem that we have with a shifting resource mix is that we, you know, those thermal power plants, those ones that can ramp up and ramp down when conditions change are retiring because in addition to renewable energy being cleaner, it's often less expensive. And so it becomes harder and harder for these thermal plants to compete. So this leads to more and more fluctuations in energy and supply. And so a good uh, illustration of what we're talking about with this increased penetration is what's called the duck curve. And, and that you see on your slide here. This is really for California. And that top line there that's marked 2012 is, is what things pretty much looked like before there was a whole lot of solar um, on the system. And so it makes sense when you look at this demand for electricity that as you get to the point where people are waking up, they get up, they start turning things on, and um, electricity goes up. And then as the sun goes up, more electricity is being used, air conditioners are turning on, and then you get a little bit of a dip as everybody's in their car on their way home, and then folks start to get home, and you have this other spike. And all of that's still happening. None of that has changed. In fact, some of that demand is probably even increasing as populations increase and we get more things that we're plugging in. But now we've also got solar panels on our roofs, and we've got solar panels in freeway uh, exchanges, and we've got all of these things on the the distribution system. So the, the wires that are connected to our houses and businesses. And so when that happens, the net demand on the grid really drops and that's what we see in that bottom line. And kind of to keep with the airplane analogy, what that creates is this really steep ramp at the end of the day. And just like when an airplane, that takeoff is the most dangerous part of the flight or 
in in elect, you know in terms of electricity it's the most dangerous part of kind of keeping the grid stable um, if something were to fail in that kind of a climb bad things will happen if it's an airplane that's going to crash if it's the grid it'll crash too if there's enough that falls offline as that demand is increasing that sharply um, and this gets exacerbated with extreme weather events so in addition to the challenges that we're already seeing from a changing resource mix we're seeing more and more extreme weather events we're seeing them in the summertime in california and in the west and we see them in texas in the west we really see them in the summer all over the place now but we also see them in the winter time and you know these heat waves and cold snaps are really leading to peaks in energy demand and disruptions in energy supply that stress the grid out incredibly. It's critical for the grid that supply and demand are equal at all points in time. And when we combine the fact that we have less control over the supply than we used to have, and we have more extreme events creating more stress on both demand and supply, um, we're seeing more and more and more stress across multiple grids worldwide, certainly here in the United States. Um, this is also exacerbated by the fact that um, homes and generation in certain places were built for specific weather conditions. So in Texas, it was built for heat. It wasn't really built. The systems weren't built to manage cold. And by the systems, I mean both homes and businesses as well as the supply of electricity. It was meant to deal with heat. And so in order to keep things stable, we have to figure out how to keep supply and demand equal. Again, they have to be equal all the time. And so when we're talking about the importance of grid stability, we're talking about how do we keep the lights on? That's really what we're talking about here. So as uses surges lead to price spikes, we have to match demand to that but it goes beyond price spikes. We're also talking about reliability. And if things get too far out of balance, that's where we end up seeing blackouts. A lot of us are familiar with rolling blackouts. And just to draw a quick distinction, a rolling blackout is when the grid operator, you know, the person who's in control of the grid, so in California, that would be the California ISO, or in Texas, that would be ERCOT, or the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. But they're the ones who are actually controlling what's happening on the grid to maintain the stability. If things get too far out of balance, they will initiate rolling blackouts to keep the whole grid from going dark. Because if the whole grid goes dark, you're talking about months before you can bring things back up. So there's a massive economic impact of everything going dark. And so the rolling blackouts are a way to mitigate that. But by the time you are, are doing those rolling blackouts, things are so tenuous. It is so possible at any moment for everything to go dark. And if that happens, it is a massive catastrophe, not just from a cost standpoint, but also from a human standpoint. Imagine what it would be like to be without power over an entire grid for months as they try to bring it, bring it back up. And so like, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna maintain this stability? Because peaker plants are really expensive. They're bad for the environment uh, and you just can't put them where you used to put them. You can't just say, I'm gonna build a new power plant here now. It's getting harder and harder to, to permit them, to get them in place. And again, they're not really um, cost competitive with a lot of the renewables. So it's hard to incentivize somebody to build one absent some kind of external mechanism to require that build. So if it's hard to just build more power plants in, in this environment, how do we create stability. And one of the best ways to do that, and the way that LEAP does it, and the way the grid point does it, and one of the ways that, um, <coughs> pardon me, one of the ways the NRG does it is through demand side flexibility. And when we're talking about demand side flexibility, what we mean is things that are using power that can use less power when we need them to use less power. And what is really coming to the market now are these internet connected devices that either use or control energy. So we're talking about HVAC systems. They're much more advanced than they used to be. Um, via smart thermostats, through heat pumps, 
We have solar panels on roofs. We have batteries in many cases that are connected to those thermostats. We have electric vehicles. And all of these things we're putting in our businesses, we're putting in our homes for various reasons. But they have the capability to do more than what we bought these things to do. So we probably, you know, for businesses, we might buy a building management system or work with a, a building management company to help us control costs or to help us make sure that our lighting is optimal for customers. But that control also creates other opportunities. And so this is how it works when we're using demand side flexibility. We have these surges in electricity demand, either because it's a normal day and the sun's coming up or because we're in an extreme weather event, or we have a surge in relative demand because we lost supply or a transmission line along the way. And so if we're gonna utilize demand flexibility, when these things happen, there is a signal. Um, can we go back to the last slide? There's gonna be some kind of a signal. In many cases, it's a pricing signal. And once that pricing signal is received, somebody like Leap will transmit that signal to somebody like GridPoint. And those users will have their demand reduced a little bit. That might be a couple degrees difference on an HVAC setting. It might be cycling through some freezers in a, in a grocery store. But it's, it's making small changes that enable you to keep running your business the way you need to run your business, um, but also reduce demand. And when we do that across thousands and thousands of sites, it's really the same thing as turning that power plant up to get more power. The effect is exactly the same on the grid. So when we reduce that demand, we help stabilize the grid. And since we looked just like that power plant turning up, we get to be compensated much like a power plant um, to, for providing that same type of benefit. And we can go to the next slide. So there have been historically ways that demand side resources, so users of electricity, have been able to participate in providing grid stability. But for the most part, they've only been used in emergency scenarios. So when things are about to, to go dark, right? When we're about to institute rolling blackouts, then you'll have some demand response programs that will um, encourage users to, to stop using electricity or to turn down their usage to prevent that blackout. There are also some programs that are meant to help reduce the peak demand in a given year or a given season. And so you might curtail every day at a certain time in, say, July and August to try and, and keep that, that peak load down so that you're not being charged and also maybe so that we don't have to build as many peaking power plants. Um, but as the grid changes, as this resource mix has changed, and as we see more and more and more extreme weather events um, that are happening at any given point in time, we see the need for more flexibility, for something that goes beyond this emergency program where you might be called to curtail for three hours at a time once a year. What we need are resources that can respond for a very short period of time to take up a short gap between supply and demand or to help mitigate prices a little bit or exposure to prices a little bit. And we need to be able to do that in a way that isn't too disruptive. We need people to keep going about what they're doing without having to, to uh, be negatively impacted by helping to provide this service. Because as it turns out, most of us are using a bit more electricity than we need to use most of the time. And so there's, there's a range in there where we can stop using a little bit and have very little impact to us as long as that doesn't stretch out over too long of a time. And so while we still need these traditional demand side programs, um, and those are ideal for certain types of users, more and more users who are more and more able to provide this flexible demand happen to be coming online right as we need more and more of them. I will go ahead and turn it back to you, Caroline. Thanks so much, Jaden. Before I pass things over to NRG, we have a quick poll question that we would like to get uh, all of your audience input on. <laughs> so we're curious, where are you in the participation of grid services programs? And so you should be able to answer that right on your screen.
Okay, I just give folks a few more seconds. All right, thanks everyone. Let's share those results. Okay, this is really interesting. So it looks like about 50% of respondents here are already participating in grid services programs, which is fantastic. Um, and then we've got um, a solid number who either haven't started or in the planning stages as well. Um, so now I would love to pass things over to Tracy Alexander at NRG, who's going to talk more about how your business can participate in grid services and some of the opportunities with NRG. Take it away, Tracy. Quote of uh, most often quoted line of 2021, you're on mute. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Alexander. I'm in business development for NRG, and uh, I love the poll question. It's really great to see how many people are already participating in grid services programs. Um, uh, my background uh, with NRG is I started about four years ago in developing the behind the meter battery storage model for North America for NRG. And then uh, currently, and what I'm gonna be focused on today is my role in ERCOT in developing innovative products for our large commercial and industrial customers to save on energy costs. Um, the reason I bring up the battery storage component is that part of what we're talking about today is how to increase your load flexibility to participate in the grid services programs. And oftentimes uh, having any kind of asset on site will help you do that. Um, obviously, we're also talking about automation and how that will help you participate in the programs. So to go over what I do want to talk about today, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about NRG and where we are today. I'm going to talk about ERCOT specific demand response programs. And for those of you who are already participating in ERCOT programs, um, I'm going to say really high level because you know the complexities of those programs. And so We'll say pretty high level on those, but I want to give you an idea of what the options are. And then I'm going to talk about NRG's approach to grid services programs as someone who can help you manage both the supply and demand side of your um, of your energy management plan, of your energy management plan. And then finally, we'll talk about how to get engaged. You know, how do you get started, or what do you need to be thinking about? when you consider participating in these programs. So I'll start with NRG. Um, are you, uh, Caroline, can you go to the first NRG uh, slide? I'm still seeing the quick poll. I don't know if that's what everyone else is seeing, but. Yep, sorry about that folks. Just having some trouble closing that, this poll question here. Well, I can keep, I'll keep going. And then when you can get the slide up, that's great. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so NRG at the beginning of this year completed their acquisition of direct energy. And I bring that up because, you know, as we talk through options today, I mean, NRG and direct energy as one company, we've really expanded our breadth of knowledge of, our customer base, of our customer needs. And not only have we expanded our, our access to expertise uh, with both companies as one, we've also expanded our reach into other markets. I will be speaking specifically to ERCOT today, but just so you know, we have, we have been very excited about this acquisition. And now as one company, uh, we've been able to, you know, just better, we feel like we're better able to serve our customers and understand their needs. We do serve over 6 million customers, uh, both residential and commercial and industrial. We're very proud of our focus on customer experience. We actually had a company meeting today where we talked about it and how important it really is to our customers. Not only, I mean, it's important to us to have for our customers to have a good experience, but we also learned that customers, uh, a vast majority of customers actually consider the experience as much as they as much as they consider the product. 
And so we have had consistently an over 50 net promoter score. And if you're familiar with net promoter scores, that's actually a very good score. And especially for an energy company, I think it's really good. <laughs> and then, uh, so anyway, we're excited about that. And we, are, we do have a, a very strong focus on our customer experience. Uh, we are a leading energy provider. We do have over 2,700 megawatts of demand response and load management under our, in our portfolio. And then finally, just to, that was just kind of a thinking about how energy plays a role in the grid services. It's in those demand response and load management programs that we, uh, we are very active in the ERCOT market and now in other markets. And then finally, in the, in the innovation, as I mentioned, with this combined company, we're just really able to innovate around how we can help customers meet their goals. And the goals have expanded from just saving on your energy bill. They've expanded to greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction. It's expanded to sustainability goals. And so we're looking at ways to do all of those things for our customers. So that's a little bit about NRG. Let's dive into ERCOT and some of the traditional ERCOT programs. All right, so um, with this slide, what I try to do is stay pretty high level, but um, key in on some of the, the parameters of these programs that you need to keep in mind and you need to understand. So in ERCOT, we have a combination of both emergency and economic demand response programs that help you generate revenue or uh, savings. Typically, the season that we focus on is in the summer. Like Jaden said, you know, our um, equipment, our market, like everyone is really focused on this June through September, that June through September timeframe. So much of the demand response programs are focused in there. Obviously, we know that we need to have something in place to support the grid around the year. So I'm gonna start with uh, the three that I think are um, probably most familiar to you. You've got emergency response service, which is ERS, commercial load management, CLM, and then a coincident, coincident peak program is 4CP. You may also know uh, 4CP as a transmission cost recovery factor on your monthly bill. This is an important one we'll spend some time on because it can be 30 to 70% of your total monthly bill. If you're not aware of that, it's a very important uh, program or a, an important part of an opportunity to curtail to generate savings for you. And so let's, let's dive into some specifics. Um, as I mentioned, June through September is our focus, but ERS, is an annual program you can participate all year. You can choose different contract periods in which to engage, and you can also choose which time periods during the day your operations is most available to curtail load. And so as we think about ERS, this is the one everyone uh, probably heard most about in February. And the, so February was a time when ERS was actually called. It was also called in uh, the summer of 2019. And then before that, it was called in the summer of 2014. So it does not get called every year. It only gets called in those emergency situations that Jaden described to us. And, and if, you're, if you uh, commit to that program and commit an amount of load to curtail during the times that you've chosen, during the contract periods throughout the year that you've chosen, then you will not necessarily be called because you know the goal is to not call an ERS event. And the goal is to just have load available in the market from customers using electricity, have it available to curtail when ERCOT needs it. Some of the challenges that I believe customers have with enrolling in ERS is that it only gives you a 30 minute, 30 minute notification. There's actually also an option for a 10 minute notification that sometimes has a higher value to it. But um, for the purposes of what we're talking about, it, you, you need to think about, can you respond in 30 minutes 
to an event and begin to curtail uh, your load down to the level that you've agreed to within 30 minutes. Some customers find that a, a deal breaker. Um, others uh, can do it and so they actively participate all year for all time periods in ERS. CLM is a program that is run by your utilities, so Centerpoint, Encore, TNMP, et cetera. And that program is only in June through September, and it is from 1 to 7 p.m. on weekdays. So this is very specific. It only gets called if ERS gets called. So there are some exclusions, as you can probably, you're thinking, you can't participate in both during that one to seven window. You can't say you will be available for both because CLM doesn't get called unless CRS is called. And so that would be a conflict and you wouldn't, you wouldn't meet your obligation. Um, CLM and ERS both will pay you a capacity payment. So it's an, a payment for your availability if there is no event called. So what happens is like, for example, in 2019 and 2014 when no event or those events were called so you were paid on your event but in the other years you would be tested and so you'll get a test once if you pass the test for ERS then you don't need to be called again and passing the test means you perform at at least a 95 percent um, rate. CLM will test you a couple of times and you will get paid based on your performance. And then when events are called, you will also get paid on those events. For CP, I wanna talk about that for just a minute. For uh, CP is not a program that you have to enroll in necessarily. It is something that you can enroll in to receive alerts about when that, uh, when they are, when four CP intervals are about to happen. And what that means is for CP, there are four coincident peaks, June, July, August, and September. They are only 15 minute intervals. And it is when demand for electricity on the ERCOT grid is at its highest for the entire month. So uh, it is a service that you can get from NRG and there are other people that offer the service, but it's critical because if you can curtail your load, if you can reduce your usage of electricity during that 15 minute interval, it can save you a significant amount of money for the entire next year. That's why that one's really important and something uh, you would probably want to look at and think about uh, how much, or not think about, but actually look at your bills and see how much you're being charged on a monthly basis and if there is a way for you to shave that peak this helps you reduce your cost, but it helps the grid. Uh, again, referring back to some of the things that Jaden said about uh, reducing those peaks. We, you know, you're still going to get charged regardless of what that highest coincident peak is. But if we, as a collectively as a market, can reduce that, we stay away from having so much, so high of a peak that we get into any kind of grid instability position. So that is, uh, believe it or not, that's a high level <laughs> view of ERCOT demand response programs. Um, but these are, you know, call it demand response, call it grid services. These are ways that you can participate to help maintain a stable ERCOT grid. So now I wanna go on to NRG and how we look at these programs collectively and how we look at um, how we look at both the supply and dem demand side of load management. So uh, in 2019, we did hit three 15 minute intervals where the price spiked to its high highest level in ERCOT. And from that, we spoke with some of our customers about how we could help them manage their load during those price spikes. And there are several benefits to looking, this at, looking at this as a strategic load management perspective. So it's a bigger perspective than just ERCOT programs and demand response and curtailment, but as a supply provider and as someone who can help on the demand side, NRG has the ability to look at this strategically 
to provide some key benefits to our customers. Um, it improves uh, strategic load management and looking at collectively as a whole can reduce your overall cost of supply. We can also look at programs that are tailored to your business. So which are the ones that you can participate in and be successful? And ultimately it uh, maximizes the value of demand flexibility in ERCOT. On the other side, on the demand side, um, looking at this strategically can help improve demand management. So we're looking at your supply, where you're getting your electricity, and then we're looking at how you're using it. And we can optimize that flexible load in demand response programs like we just described. Um, we have developed a program that I'll touch on a little bit here that is really more keeping the customer's needs in mind versus the grids, but also supports grid stability. Let me just pause there and talk a little bit about the program. We developed a program in 2020 in, a, in response at the time to the 2019 uh, price spikes and demand on the grid. And it's a, it's a program that, that is non-emergency, so you're not going to have to respond in 30 minutes, but some of the key parameters are we give you a day ahead notification. So you have a day to understand how you need to change your operations in order to meet your obligation. We require, we require at least a 50% participation, 50% of the uh, committed load into the program in order for you to get paid. And then we credit you on your bill um, at the end of the season. Right now it is also June through September um, because that's where we, we uh, have the most opportunity to strain the grid in Texas. Um, we have an engineer that we can assign to you to help you uh, create a reduction action plan to understand how you will actually reduce your load, not only for the NRG program, but for the other programs we've talked about. And then finally, the benefit overall is this increases your load value. Um, so your savings can actually, there's a little bit of a tongue twister, can increase your flexible load and also your load flexibility. So what that means is you can use um, the money that you save to invest back into your energy management system to be able to then participate more in more programs with more load, um, just have additional savings generated. And what you'll hear from Andrew is a case study, and we have had customers who, across uh, participating in strategic load management, have thousands in bill credits. Okay, let me uh, move on to my last slide and wrap this up, and we can uh, then hear from Andrew. Um, some things you need to think about as in uh, participating in any of the grid services as a business, you need to determine if you have flexible load, Think about where you can shift load to other times of the day. Think about where you can shut down any operations when called for any of these grid services. You might have some unused demand that you could actually shut down a production line, for example, or a portion of your building that's not populated um, that doesn't need the HVAC. Do you have a generator or another asset on site to which you could switch load during an event? And then Finally, are you able to automate your load control and more easily turn down, shift, or um, shut down load when an event is called? And you know, registering for the right program is really important. We can help you do that. And it's just, again, key to understanding your operations as compared to the program requirements. And finally, in conclusion, I would just say that if nothing else, please know that flexible load is valuable in ERCOT. So if you have it, you have companies like NRG and, and LEAP and uh, GridPoint looking at ways to help you generate savings and to support the grid in critical times. So thank you, Caroline. I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Tracy. Really appreciate all those insights and the details about the programs. So now I'd like to turn things over to Andrew Hammond at GridPoint to talk about some real customer stories and how GridPoint is working in these programs. Take it away, Andrew. Excellent. Thanks, Caroline. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Andrew Hammond. Um, I'm the Vice President of Utility Solutions uh, here at GridPoint. 
Um, I'll quickly just give you a little background on, on GridPoint, um, and then I'll dive into these slides in the next you know, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, GridPoint was founded in 2003. Uh, we provide energy efficiency, resiliency, and grid interactive solutions to leading enterprises and mass market businesses uh, nationwide. We work with folks like Chipotle, Walgreens, Target, um, you know, a number of large national leading uh, and regional brands to provide our fully managed solutions, including, you know, grid services and demand response like we're talking about today. Uh, predominantly, we focus on, on small and medium businesses, but we also work with, you know, municipal and public customers. Um, and we manage a number of programs across the country, not only, you know, the program we're talking about in, in Texas today, but um, over 22 utility energy efficiency and, and DR programs nationwide. So for our customers, you know, that have fleets outside of Texas, we offer the ability of, you know, participating in similar programs, you know, at their buildings and their facilities, you know, located in, in other ISO and utility territories nationwide. Um, the, the goal here is really kind of taking, you know, what Jaden and Tracy spoke about kind of at the market and the utility level and really, you know, applying that to the building. And, you know, the way that GridPoint does that is we really focus on making participation very easy so that our customers and their facilities can really maximize the potential of the flexible resources they have on site. You know, Jaden spoke about this earlier in regard to connected energy devices. Um, and Tracy mentioned this and kind of how to participate. But there's a number of energy consuming devices within each building and facility, you know, that customers own and operate nationwide that are kind of underutilized, that are sitting there at times that can be tapped into to provide, you know, revenue for your business, but also great kind of benefits and grid stability and program participation. And the way that we set this up, it's, it's very easy for customers to participate. Our goal is to make a, a customized approach, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in the next slide, to enable participation and insight and control over how your site responds to events, both during, you know, prior to the event, during the event, and after the event. And in so doing, we kind of, you know, take all of that off the customer's shoulders and we provide a total turnkey from the very beginning of analyzing your assets and analyzing your sites and creating a baseline of your energy usage, as well as risk adjusting your ability of providing load. And then we automate that load curtailment and that dispatch. So it's truly hands off for customers and who can then earn you know, revenue and participation through these programs throughout the year with no manual interventions you know, at the site level or on the customer's behalf. In so doing, you know, as you know, Jaden Tracy mentioned, you know, at a core level, we're helping to support grid stability. But really, what that means to your business, you know, and we saw this in Texas last winter, and we saw it in, in California the summer before. But you know, the risk of blackouts from extreme weather events and grid outages are reduced when we collectively reduce the strain and reduce the demand on the grid. So by participating on a single site or, you know, dozens of sites or, you know, for some of our partners and customers, hundreds of sites, you're really supporting that grid stability and reducing that risk of local blackouts. And as Jada mentioned, you know, that can not only just be like, you know, a day or two, but a full grid wide blackout and outage will impact your business for weeks at a time. Um, and so that really can't be understated and it's becoming kind of more and more exacerbated by not only extreme weather, but also, you know, the, the prevalence of renewables and the variability of renewable energy, excuse me, upon the, uh, the ERCOT grid. And finally, we'll talk about this a little more in the next slide, but we take a very data-driven approach. We're gonna install sensors and monitors on site so that we're monitoring real-time conditions so that you can rest assured that by participating, you're not gonna have adverse effects to employee or, comfort or uh, customer comfort or your business operations. So really important to get the most benefit out of DR and not even realize in most cases, you know, at the site level that an event is occurring. Uh, I think Caroline, the next slide's a poll. So I'll hand it back to you for the, the quick poll. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so 
I'm going to send out this next poll question. We'd love to hear which of the following grid services benefits uh, is most important to your business. So I'll launch that here and just give you a few seconds to submit. Just a couple more seconds here. All right, thanks everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and share the results. Okay, looks like we have we have a clear winner here. Um, earning revenue without just interrupting site operations seems to be the most important benefit, um, followed by supporting grid stability and saving energy. All right, I'm gonna Excellent. hand that back over to you, Andrew, let me just. Cool, thanks, Caroline. Well, while you're doing that, I, I think, you know, this is really interesting. I, I really honestly anticipated saving energy to be number one and avoiding operational kind of uh, issues to be number two. That's typically what, you know, the, the feedback when we're working with, with customers, you know, we want to save energy, we want to optimize, we understand that that's a great opportunity for us, but not at the expense of our site operations and performance. Um, that's very interesting. And I assume that the grid stability piece, you know, for folks on this call who are in the ERCOP market is probably fairly timing, timely with some of the, uh, the issues at the grid level that you've dealt with in your businesses in the last, you know, 12 months or so. Um, so, you know, very interesting to, to see that. Um, but I think ultimately this really feeds into, you know, the slide uh, here of, the essential nature of kind of creating that custom approach to participation. And we really can't, you know, underline and, you know, kind of highlight further, you know, uh, enough the fact that, you know, you're always kind of having that balance of building performance and employee comfort with kind of energy optimization and getting the most revenue from, you know, your peak demand or your demand response reductions. And so by really taking both of those into account, you can meet that number one goal of not having, you know, adverse site effects during your event. And that's at its core to the approach that we take with LEAP. And I think that's very important for, you know, obviously overall, you know, satisfaction and the long-term potential of these programs and, and the revenue and, and energy savings that can be, um, you know, achieved at the, the site level. Um, and so really in order to do that, and I talked about this a little bit, but I'll go a little deeper into the customized approach. So we first start by baselining your energy usage on site. Historically, pre-COVID, we would look at 12 months of bills. However, as everyone knows, and has probably been impacted greatly in the last year, you know, your site operations over the last 24 months have, have not been normal. And so in this scenario, we'd collect a little more information typically, you know, 24 to 36 months to really get a good picture of the load curve, the load shape, and, and when and where your site is using energy. In order to do that and take it a step further, we look at the various assets or equipment that you have on site. You know, Tracy talked about this earlier from a high level. We take a very hands-on approach and we'll work with our partners and we'll work with customers to individually look at your lighting, your HVAC, EV charging infrastructure, on-site storage, on-site generators, solar, um, plug load, et cetera, and really understand, number one, what you're doing today. So we kind of have a baseline of understanding where you're at, and then we can go in deep into additional uh, areas of optimization, and then balance that with your overall business you know, requirements. If you are you know, a full serve restaurant and you have folks that are sitting you know, in your dining room for an hour plus at a time, you, know, you probably have a little less of an aggressive risk model than a convenience store where people are coming in and out, the doors opening quite a bit. So you wanna tailor your strategy and you wanna tailor the program specifically to your building type and then understand after that, the assets that you have you know, on site that have that additional flexible capacity that can be you know, tapped into to generate revenue. By monitoring 
at all times and using sensors to understand zonal temperatures, external temperatures, internal temperatures, and other site conditions, we can maintain comfort, comfort and the building performance during all events. Um, Jaden or Tracy, I can't recall, but someone mentioned kind of the, the, the duration of events. You know, we could have a five or 15 minute event, which probably is not gonna be noticeable no matter what. When you start having a one or two hour type event or more of a traditional kind of ERS four hour event, it's really critical that you have that data and that you're monitoring that in real time so that those site parameters and conditions are not breached that lead to a bad customer experience. By offering you know, kind of this um, unique strategic load management program, it's all about performance. And so a customer gets the avoided cost benefit or the bill credit from their supplier but they also have the ability of opting out. So if there's a unique business requirement that would make you know, participating on that certain day not good for you or your business, you have the ability of opting out. Um, so we have that flexibility. And then finally, by partnering and by aggregating many sites together, smaller and medium businesses that have historically have not met the minimum requirements to participate in these programs can now tap in in an aggregated fashion and, and participate in these new revenue streams and get the benefit of this ongoing grid services revenue and energy optimizations and savings. Uh, next slide, please. I'll quickly go into a, a case study um, of a participating customer um, who we have um, uh, worked with this season uh, in this program in ERCOT. Um, uh, they're a national uh, movie theater chain. Um, so for them, obviously, you know, as a movie theater, you have customers that are coming in that are sitting in your individual theaters for an hour and a half, two, you know, or more hours at a time. So maintaining kind of their normal business operations was one of the main requirements. And so the flexibility of having, you know, opt out of this event, you know, based on event, you know, movie premieres, or even you know we uh, integrated into their point of sale system, we can see a specific theater and specific movie and the number of tickets that are sold. So you know when James Bond launches this Friday, we want to make sure we're not curtailing the theater where all the James Bond tickets are being sold because they're going to be sold out. And so we've implemented a strategy that really takes that into account and it automates the site performance based on their actual tickets sold or other events, giving them zero impact on customer or employee comfort, as well as their you know, building performance and operations. In addition to that, as far as our event strategy was concerned, we wanted to kind of take that customer approach like I mentioned. So we needed to understand the specifics of the building. You know, so we're monitoring, and, and this is a very specific use case, but we're monitoring you know, down to the CO2 and the relative humidity level. So we're really making sure that these parameters are not being breached by energy measures and by the optimization that are going to lead to, you know, customer complaints or employee complaints and a poor experience overall. We're looking at set points within those zones and we're monitoring the recovery times. So we know coming out of the event, how long does it take to get back to the, you know, the proper set point and, you know, if any comfort parameters, you know, may be breached then we can respond on that in real time. The results from this were very you know, encouraging. And as Tracy said, for ERS, and this isn't ERS, this is our, you know, our strategic load management program, but for ERS, there's only been you know, a handful of events over the last you know, few years. So customers within ERCOT, even those that have participated in DR, aren't used to being called. In this program, this customer was called three times this summer for a six total events, or sorry, six total event hours. So averaging two hours per event. By utilizing our event strategy and our customized approach, the customer had 100% satisfaction, no complaints from customers, no complaints from employees. They had no idea that events even occur. That is our goal. We wanna have it set it and forget it and be completely hands off to the customer at the site level and automate their curtailment. So at the end of the season, they get a check 
and they get that full incentive from the on-bill credit from NRG for their supply, and they don't even know traditionally when those you know uh, per particular events have happened. We of course provide the reporting, so we're in that instance of what's going on. But from the actual day-to-day -day operations, they shouldn't see a difference in site operations prior to the event, during the event, or post-event. Um, and so we're very happy with the results of this. And you know, the customer is very much chomping at the bit to increase performance and increase enrollment next year to tap into these new revenue streams. I know we're getting close to the end, so I'll try to breeze through this last slide in a couple minutes because I want to make sure we have you know proper time for questions. But really, and Jaden kind of showed this earlier. When you look at this at the grid level, and you know, you say, why is demand response or why are grid services required? And it's really all about closing the gap between forecasted supply and forecasted demand by providing the aggregation and the automation over hundreds or thousands of participating sites. The Gridpoint Intel Intelligent Energy Network can respond in real time to those pricing signals that are being sent out by LEAP and then dynamically curtail the load to close that gap in supply and demand. And when we do that, you know, on a very large basis across dozens, hundreds, or thousands of sites, you know, you take that, you know, site level and you amortize it and you have, you know, megawatts of load that you contribute back to the, the ERCOT grid. That is meaningful. That is, you know, to Jaden's earlier example, that is what a peaker plant does. So we are creating virtual power plants through the intelligent network, responding in an automated fashion to the, the grid signal being generated by LEAP, and then curtailing that load at times of high stress on the grid. And I think this is a good kind of graphical you know, illustration of that. Um, and finally, uh, Caroline, if you could slip, go to the last slide. So, you know, as far as next steps, um, you know, if you're a business owner, you wanna learn more about the program and your potential uh, for demand response, you know, you can visit uh, the Gridpoint website right here. And we have a lot of information about both this program as well as other demand response programs. Um, if you're a retail energy provider, um, you can contact LEAP to learn more about this. Um, if you're an NRG customer, you can go through NRG directly um, and they can help kind of tap you in to this program and talk about the specific benefits. Beyond demand response and demand beyond grid services, through the, the, the energy management platform uh, that Gridpoint provides, you can also see 10 to 15 percent, you know, uh, ongoing energy consumption reduction. So we're really just talking about demand response, but that's just one component of the overall kind of solution that we can provide to customers that drive deep energy optimization, you know, both from demand response as well as ongoing energy management. So I think that's a good stopping point. I probably could keep talking for another 45 minutes or so, but we'll definitely go far over. And uh, Caroline, I'll flip it back to you and we can start the, the Q&A session. Thanks so much, Andrew, and to Jaden and Tracy for explaining grid services and how businesses can get involved. So we have just a few minutes here for questions. So if you would like to ask the panelists something, please do submit a question um, and we'll answer as many as we can. So it looks like we have a couple of questions here about what kind of assets, energy assets and devices participants can use to join these programs. Um, so maybe Jaden or Andrew, could you talk a little about what kind of devices um, businesses will need if they want to participate? Um, can they use a solar system or do they need to have storage? Uh, can generators participate? Tell us a little more about that. Yeah, um, so the, the Gridpoint Intelligent Energy Management Platform can connect to various behind the meter assets. You know, traditionally when you look at demand response, you look at peak load reduction. So lighting, HVAC, um, you know, on-site generators, heat pumps, you know, things of that nature have been really, you know, good assets and good equipment type that you'd want to grid connect and automate that you can bid into these programs. More and more, we're seeing you know folks that obviously have storage. So energy storage is, is also a very good you know fit for this program. We're seeing plug load, switch load, you know a number of you know those type of assets. Solar is good overall, kind of as a baseline load reducer. 
So when you look at that, you know, duct curve that Jaden showed earlier, it's going to reduce your overall building consumption and reduce your overall demand at those times of high solar production. It's not necessarily going to provide flexible on-demand capacity that you can call upon into these types of programs. So it's complementary, but it's not something that you typically, you know, call on and flex because, you know, you're not going to turn on and off the sun. And I don't know, Jaden, if you have anything else you'd, you'd want to add to that. No, I think, I think that answers it quite well, Andrew. Great, thanks so much. Um, so following up on that, um, how much excess capacity do businesses have, have to have in order to participate? What's, uh, what's the minimum requirement? That's the beauty of the aggregated program. So traditionally businesses needed about 100 kW, 100 kilowatts of load minimum at a site level to participate. Through this program, you could have a single kilowatt. So any business, no matter how small, can participate, assuming there is some flexible load there. And you know, I think all of us would, would tell folks that every site has some level of flexible capacity that's being underutilized. And because we're you know aggregating this across you know dozens, hundreds, or thousands of sites, that minimum load requirement is not really you know a consideration we have to concern ourselves with on a, on a site by site level. Yeah, I would right. add to that just a little bit and say that it's actually a lot of these smaller loads that are particularly beneficial for the kind of flexible programs that we're talking about today. You know, imagine I was I was a manufacturer, a die casting facility making engine blocks or something. If I am going to reduce a megawatt of load, I have to stop making engine blocks to do that. But if I am going to make a small adjustment to a thermostat that provides, you know, two kilowatts, 10 kilowatts, 50 kilowatts of load or something along those lines, I can do that and have the kind of, of non-impact that Andrew was talking about a moment ago. Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. Tracy, we have a question here about program participation. Um, can my facilities participate in both the traditional ERCOT programs as well as those new ones that you were talking about? Yes, the answer, the, the simple answer is yes. Uh, they are, the values are what we call stackable, which means you can, you know, add value. You can get 100% of value of one and add in 100% value of the other. As I had mentioned though, like for example, CLM and ERS don't are not because you can't, I mean, they are in the, in the sense that you can enroll in ERS. So let's say it's June 15th and you want to enroll in all, you want to be available for ERS all day and you want to participate in CLM. Well, you cannot enroll in ERS from 1 to 7 p.m. if you remember that time frame because those two work uh, hand in hand. But you can layer on 4CP uh, with any of those because that's really just about capturing that 15 minute interval. And then our um, program specifically to NRG is also stackable with those other programs. They don't uh, typically impact each other negatively in any way, especially with 4CP and our program. Those events uh, typically happened at the same time, so our customers are really happy about the money that they were just, that they were able to save this summer. So the simple answer is yes, and I you know I would just say that it's really important that you work with a partner to help you understand which programs will work best for your business and your operations, so you don't get caught in a non-performance position with any of the programs we want we want the example that andrew laid out to be the experience for everyone so we will work with you and it's really important because the programs i mean i touched on touched on some of these at a very high level and they have a lot of nuances that we would want to work with you on to to uh, make sure you're enrolled in the right one or not just the right one but the right programs uh, <laughs> <with an S. laughs> Thanks, Tracy. That's a really great reminder. Well, uh, we are about to reach the top of the hour here, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. 
thanks again to our panelists and thanks again for all of you for attending and asking your questions. Please do keep in touch and let us know if you have any questions about joining grid services. We would really love uh, to see as many businesses as possible um, taking the leap, if you will, to participate in grid services and earn some revenue and help support the grid. All right, thanks all and have a great rest of your day.